Hello and welcome to this Child Welfare Capacity Building Center for States Total Cost of Ownership Toolkit webinar. Today's call is being recorded. Before we begin, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ms. Christy Stankovich. Please go ahead. Thank you again. Good afternoon. As the operator just mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. This webinar is also interactive and will, re will feature several polling questions. Attendees may ask questions through the question and answer pod on the right-hand side of the Adobe Connect screen. You'll also find a resources pod on your right-hand side as well. Phone lines will be muted throughout the presentation. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Kate McElroy-Helm of the Capacity Building Center for States. And this is Christy Stankovich. I will continue with the presentation while we wait for Kate to jump back on. Today, we'll go over through the agenda, starting with introductions and the Center for States overview. Next, the introduction and total cost of ownership, development approach, overviews and examples of costs, followed by the key considerations for jurisdictions, the toolkit review, and then finally the questions and closing. I'd like to introduce Kate McElroy-Helm, the data specialist for the Center for States, Michelle Pryor, who is a consultant for the Center for States, as well as Gita Manas and Tressa Young of the Children's Bureau. The purpose of today's call, uh, the Capacity Building Center for States supports to, to serve public child welfare agencies in efforts to effectively initiate and sustain change and innovation, resulting in improved system, organizational, and program performance. Before we begin the presentation, we wanted to provide some background on the Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative and the Center for States. In October of 2014, ICF was awarded a contract by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administrating for Children and Families, Children's Bureau, to establish the new Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative. The Center for States, the Center for Tribes, and the Center for Courts are partners who formed the Capacity Building Collaborative that consolidates services that have been previously provided by the National Child Welfare Resource Centers. This consolidation increases coordination, leverages resources, and provides more strategic service provision. And I'll pause for just a second to see if we've got Kate back on the line. Hi, Christy. It's Kate. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just Anything. totally got dropped off. The line. So thanks for uh, thanks for taking over those slides. Um, I'll just pick up where you left off, and then maybe once we get a little further, we'll go back to the introductions. Um, great. So so the collaborative. Um, I'm sorry. I should back up. This is Kate McElroy Helm with the Center for States, and thanks so much for joining us today. I apologize for that little technical glitch. So um, we're just going to go ahead and, and continue with these slides about the the center and the collaborative. Um, so our goals are to work with partners and jurisdictions to support capacity building um, to lead to improved outcomes for children and families. And we do this by partnering with states, territories, tribes, and courts to identify, design, and implement innovative solutions that meet the unique needs um, of each jurisdiction. The Center for State serves state and territorial public child welfare agencies and Title IV -E waiver demonstration jurisdictions. ICF International supports the Center for States where uh, Maggie Bishop is the project director. And you might recognize ICF from our work with the Child Welfare Information Gateway as ICF has a long history of working on technical assistance contracts with the Children's Bureau and our other government agencies. The Center for States aims to provide evidence-based capacity building support services that will improve performance and support states and territories in effectively initiating, implementing, and sustaining change and innovation. A map of the United States shows 10 federal regions. To achieve this goal, we work with our partners to create and deliver coordinated, um, inclusive, and well-informed capacity building services. The Center for States is designed to support the Children's Bureau vision of providing strategic evidence-informed services to build the capacity of state and territorial public child welfare agencies. Our goals are to improve system, organizational, and program performance, significantly enhance safety, permanency, and well-being of children, youth, and families, and use an evidence-based approach um, 
and Consolidated Capacity Building Services for Child Welfare. So as I mentioned, my name is Kate McElroy-Helm, and I am a data specialist with the Center for States and also the priority area agenda lead uh, for Child Welfare Information Systems. And I started with the Center in January 2015 as a state liaison um, with, for the Center, and when uh, the data team expanded, I transitioned over to my current role. And before joining the Center, I was with the uh, National Resource Center for Child Welfare Data and Technology um, for about 10 years. Michelle Pryor is a consultant with the Center for States and has developed most of the content that you'll be uh, seeing and hearing about today. She has more than 25 years experience consulting with child welfare and other health and human services agencies across the country. Her experience in child welfare includes information system development, practice model implementation, revenue enhancement, program compliance, and project management. And she was previously a consultant with the Mountains and Plains Child Welfare Implementation Center and led the State of New Mexico Pinion Project uh, for that center. And we also want to acknowledge our Children's Bureau Division of State Systems partners and FPOs that are on the line with us today, uh, Gita Manis and Teresa Young, and their great assets to the center's work around supporting uh, states in their efforts to develop effective child welfare information systems. So we wanted to thank them for being here today. The objective for the webinar today is um, to understand the basics of total cost of ownership, which we'll be referring to as TCO throughout the webinar, um, and considerations related to development approaches and um, examples of information system costs. Uh, you'll also see a, a sample TCO workbook that jurisdictions can use to capture cost estimates over a multi-year period. And this is a tool that the Center for States has just um, recently um, put out on the website. We've provided it in the resources um, on your Adobe pod um, called Total Cost of Ownership Guide and Calculator. Um, and you'll be seeing a, a live demo of that today after we um, go through some of the presentation. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we'll give you some more information on where to go with any additional questions. Uh, we've also posted in the resources a, um, where you can find your Center for States liaison, who's the one that works directly with each state to um, coordinate services, and then also the state and tribal assignments for the Children's Bureau Division of State, state Systems um, analysts. Okay, so let's, with that, let's get back to the topic at hand, and we'll briefly um, go over the, more, the webinar objectives more specifically. So we're going to identify information about system readiness and planning considerations, re review development phases and the system development life cycle, um, learn and test knowledge about key considerations for implementing a child welfare information system. And uh, notice we said test knowledge. We're going to include some pop quizzes throughout the webinar um, So um, to, to test your knowledge and to see if there's any areas where we can kind of provide some more clarification. We're going to review the variety of costs that agencies um, could use in a TCO analysis. And finally, as I mentioned, we're going to view a demonstration of um, how to use the TCO uh, workbook. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle Pryor. Thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks, everyone. So what is uh, total cost of ownership and why do one? So child welfare systems are critical tools for child welfare agencies at whatever level, at a state, tribe, um, county level, at any agency level, and useful for supporting the casework that you do, tracking service delivery, and tracking programs. Um, child welfare systems should also improve processes, improve operational efficiency, and ideally achieve end user satisfaction. In addition, child welfare systems are needed to collect the data that jurisdictions need to report to aggregate that data for federal reporting and to support outcomes measurements and quality effectiveness of programs. So as a jurisdiction contemplates how their data and operational needs can be met by a child welfare information system, and you consider your options that are available in the marketplace, it's important to calculate and consider the total cost of ownership. So the next slide. What is the total cost of ownership? It's a comprehensive analysis and financial estimate including direct costs and indirect costs that are associated with purchasing, using, and retiring an information system. So you're looking at, and we'll get into some more examples and detailed examples of those costs, and you'll see them aggregated on a workbook. But in a total cost of ownership, you should usually consider hardware and software acquisition costs. So what does it cost to actually 
acquire the solution you're going to use, uh, the management and support that's needed. So that could be management through an external TMO vendor. It could be support services from hosting um, services and IT support. It, it should include end user expenses, of which there are many. And training expenses, obviously, for end users and ongoing training over the life of that system, as well as the cost of moving data from an old system to a new system. And it could be not just one old legacy system, but many. So that data migration um, cost. The total cost of ownership can extend over any period of time, um, three years, five years, 10 years are kind of common terms, but it can be over the life of that information system. So what I have created um, for today is a five-year sort of five-year TCO, a jurisdiction can use any duration of time that they want. But you're really looking at the cost of not just the development side, but also the ongoing maintenance as, it, as the solution runs, as it's upgraded, as changes come along, um, and how long, what the costs are to maintain that system in its active use. Now we can go to the next slide. So who should contribute to a, t a total cost of ownership? Um, people who have an active role in using a child welfare information system, Obviously, people that understand information technology costs, program leadership, um, budget and finance staff, and other stakeholders. So people that are familiar with the various costs that might go into an IT system should contribute to the total cost of ownership. Uh, it's not ideal that one person speculates on what the hosting charge might be for their application, or one person guesses at um, a licensing fee for help desk support. So, we, we would recommend that IT staff, program staff, budget and finance staff, and other folks really inform that, that TCO. TCO should be performed at the beginning of the software planning process. Okay, next slide. First question is pretty easy. A TCO, this is a true or false question. A TCO is best completed by a single individual without input from others. So please enter your answers. A pause while the audience answers the first polling question. Pretty much. I think everyone's got that right. In response to the polling question, 96% say yes, 4% say no. Ideally, not done by a single person. Ideally, done and informed by others, at least with input. doesn't necessarily need to have 10 owners, but it certainly should have as many contributors as have some perspective on the information system itself. So thank you. The next thing we're going to talk about in the next several slides are development approaches. So we talk about this different development approaches that are used to develop a system system development life cycle and the phases that software development implementations go through. And then we'll have a few slides on cloud versus on-premises hosting. They're included in this, the different approaches and the system development life cycle are included in this TCO because the choice that a jurisdiction might make on development approach will drive the cost in each phase of the system. And those costs should be included in the TCO itself. The slide is pretty dense, but it talks about the two major methods, um, the waterfall method and the agile method. The waterfall development approach is illustrated by arrows moving left to right. Analyze, plan, design, build, test, deploy. The agile method is illustrated by arrows for analyze and plan, a cycle for design, build, and text, and a final arrow for deploy. Underneath is an arrow for project timeline and the factors that impact the timeline, requirements change, customer turnover, and technology innovation. Well, we'll get into each of those in specific detail. And I do want to sort of point out that the project timeline, so requirements change, customers turnover, and technology innovate over the life of a project. So as you're looking at planning and analyzing your requirements, those can change when you're two years into your effort. Um, your customer could change. Technology could innovate and therefore your approach might need to adjust to that technology. So whatever approach someone takes, um, just know that those factors and those inputs will be impacting the project over its life cycle. Next slide, please. This is a high-level overview of the waterfall method, which, just like it looks, one phase is done in a sequence with one phase being completed before another phase begins. A picture shows arrows for each discrete phase, cascading in waterfall effect. Each new phase begins when another ends. The requirements are gathered, analysis is completed, and then you get to coding the system and testing the system. In the waterfall approach, there's extensive time allocated for analysis and requirements gathering, and for the design, build, and testing 
before is actually deployed and implemented, and then it goes into maintenance. The waterfall method works, works best when clients can articulate a clear vision for the final product and the final information system. So now we'll contrast that to the agile method on the next slide. A picture shows arrows in a circle. Each phase is followed by testing and feedback in a continuous process of adjustment and development. Agile development involves a series of iterations or sprints that can vary from a few weeks to a few months. And during those sprints, predetermined features are developed and delivered. So on this slide, you'll see reading from the left, develop functionality, there's a number one. So you're developing the functionality, you're integrating and testing, and then you're developing another bit of functionality. And so there's a series of those sprints where you're developing predetermined features. We have at the very top of the circle, develop functionality N. So there's N number of, you know, any number of times you might be going through these sprints but you're developing features, and then you're releasing those features. Then we're coming down the right side of the circle. As you're releasing that functionality to a customer, the client or the customer might have feedback that they want to have changes made. You might go back in now and tweak the system and make those changes and test. The agile development is only done when all the functionalities are complete. If the functionalities are not complete, you'll do another iteration. So development, the development approach in agile does an analysis, design, and build cycle multiple times over. In the waterfall method, development and build is one long phase that it has a beginning and an end, and then it moves into deployment and release. So there's just a difference in that waterfall is over time, um, Agile has a series of iterations, and Agile works best when there's probably not a clear vision of what the final product should be. So a state wants to see and make changes on the fly. The next slide, we'll talk, we'll introduce the concept of system development life cycle. So I'm just going to read the very top and we'll talk a bit about, more about this on the next several slides. But the SDLC is the process used to develop an information system, including requirements definition, requirements validation, training, and user ownership and deployment of the system. Next slide, we'll talk about the more discrete phases. So previously, a few slides back, we showed waterfall, agile, but we talked about requirements gathering, design, building, testing, and implementation in a very linear way. This just shows it more of a circular way because truly one feeds the other. And specifically, when you're talking about a system development life cycle, the requirements in an analysis phase is the phase in which you're gathering requirements and developing requirement specifications. So what, what does the system need to do? What do we want to specify about the, the expected outcomes of the system? That's a very extensive effort in either waterfall or the agile method, but what the system needs to do is the requirements and writing those down as a specification document. The specification document then feeds the next stage, which is your system analysis and design, where you're actually designing the system architecture and the software based on the requirements that were developed in the first phase. Then you move into coding and testing, where you actually organize the work, code the system, and then test the developed code against those requirements and see how well you did. So did the testing actually achieve the outcome that the requirement thought it would? At the point at which testing is complete and you're satisfied that you've actually met the objectives of the requirement, you would then implement. So that's similar to deploying the system. You deliver the system to the customer. You might find bugs during that phase and that you need to fix after that system is deployed. So implementation then moves into the maintenance mode. And during the maintenance mode, you're looking at system performance. So the speed of the, the, the system, uptime, downtime, response time. Um, you might be installing fixes for bugs and defects. You're updating system components. So the maintenance phase lasts through, that's the useful life that you might extend that system over. Is it you know, 5, 10, 20 years? But once you go through the development, design, and implementation phases, you're in a long stage of maintenance whereby Components can change, requirements can change, or bugs and things um, need to be fixed. But next, we have another polling question. So true or false, again, waterfall development is organized into sprints or iterations. A pause while the audience takes a poll. All right. Pretty overwhelmingly correct group again. Um, absolutely. Um, waterfall is not when you're doing sprints and iterations. That would be agile. So that answer is false. In response to the polling question, about 98% of respondents say false, and about 2% say true. Thank you. Go on to the next slide. 
So at the beginning of this section, we talked about that we would be discussing development approaches, which we just did, waterfall and agile, the system development life cycle, and then we have a few slides on on-premises versus in the cloud. And you hear a lot about in the cloud and what does that mean. A picture of a house represents on-premises. A picture of a cloud containing an icon of a lock represents in the cloud. Child welfare systems need infrastructure to operate. So systems uh, operate on servers, on platforms, and the infrastructure are the tools that are put in place to run that application, store the data, provide backup and recovery. And those services can operate on the premises or in the cloud. So on-premises, which is the house, um, normally requires the setup and operation of a data center within the organization. So it could be within a, a DCF agency, or it could be in a partner organization. So it could be in a jurisdiction's information technology division or administrative services. But it truly is, there's the, there's the server room, there's the data center, that's where our database administrator sits. There's a lot of cost involved in buying the servers and the hardware and the equipment to fit, to, to fit out that room, to equip that room. But that's the on-premises approach. In contrast, cloud hosting and cloud solutions are normally accessed through the internet. Our clients pay a fee to another entity to provide and maintain that infrastructure off-site. Uh, fees for cloud computing are really on a pay-as-you-go basis or a demand basis. So the number of the size of the data or the number of hours of use that you need might drive the cloud-based. So the next slide, we'll talk about some just contrasting a bit from on-premises to cloud. So we talked about it's in the jurisdiction or it's not. It's a capital expense to establish and equip and outfit the actual rooms themselves versus an operating expense. It's a fixed fee that you negotiate with your vendor. Um, if you're in-house, you can actually control the data connectivity and speed. You can control when you install upgrades. So the implementation might be longer um, since there's this build out and establishing sort of exercise. By contrast, on the cloud side, you don't get to control how fast your data gets delivered to you. You don't control when your hardware might get upgraded, but you can access those services a lot more quickly. So the simple analogy of cloud versus on-premises is, is buying versus renting. So we have another polling question. Another true or false. Cloud hosting is an operating expense that's fee-based and not a capital expense. A pause while the audience responds. OK, absolutely true. Cloud hosting is operation, 100%. That's the right answer. Thanks, everyone. So that sort of finishes the overview of development approaches, development life cycles. Now we're going to get a bit more into costs that go into a to total cost of ownership um, exercise, total cost of ownership calculation. So in the TCO, you should have cost categories that probably should include software, hardware, personnel, um, networking communications, facilities, and project office. So a facility, we talked about a facility could be your hosting facility, but there also might need to be a project office that you or a vendor works out of. Um, it could be the facilities of just your, your backup and recovery facility. So all of those costs. And again, if you're doing the, the in the cloud hosting, that cost of accessing that facility is a cost you should include, whether it's your building or someone else's building. The support that you need to access for your system to actually operate should be included in your cost. Uh, we talked about this earlier. It can be spread across different phases of the project and different fiscal years. So we talked about in the, in the system development life cycle that the design, development, and implementation phases could be, could be quick iterations, could be longer. A waterfall could be multi-year phases. And then you move into the maintenance and operation phase after you've deployed the system. And then obviously there's cost to change and upgrade the system and change out components. So your total cost should be spread across different years. But obviously some costs you'll experience early in the process and some costs you'll experience later. So we just make a note that year one in the TCO should include your agency readiness activities to the extent that you're going to perform them. Some of them might bleed into year two, um, but ideally, those costs should go in year one. Next slide. You want to make sure that looking at a TCO, um, you're looking at help desk support costs. We talked already about hosting and other operational support costs. So when you're thinking, it's, it's easy to think about the big bang cost of potentially a big custom implementation or even a, 
an off-the-shelf solution, and all these costs are going to be in the first few years of the project when we're actually building the solution. But as you're maintaining that solution, and it's, in, it's installed and running, there's costs for the help desk when the, the server goes down. There's you know, main, scheduled maintenance, so XYZ system will be offline overnight while we perform ongoing maintenance. Or you need to call the help desk to reset your password. Or you need to call the help desk to help get a new user provision. So a new staff member started, how do we get them logged on? So there's a lot of cost and support staff that help to keep the system maintain, maintaining and, use, and, and up and live and having users be active. We also want to make a note that these costs should look at things that might actually increase over time. So you should include benefit costs for salary staff. You should look at ongoing salary adjustments for staff, if you could expect that. So cost of living increases, potentially, or increasing costs as they relate to licenses and hosting fees, or if you're having a, a hosting chargeback from an information technology department. What is that cost? Can you expect costs and license costs and fees to increase by 2% or 5% year over year? And if you can, you should demonstrate that in your TCO for however long you're choosing to do it. So the next several slides, we're going to talk a bit about various categories. The categories themselves are organized to reflect the cost you might expect to acquire the tools that you need, so the hardware and the software, to ensure that the appropriate personnel are in place and involved in the development and the maintenance of the project, to set up the facilities and the utilities that support the system, and then to maintain the appropriate environments and maintain the solution while it's operational. So we have a series of categories, software costs, licenses, warranties, maintenance contracts, hardware costs, those actual hard physical assets like servers, laptops, tablets, or storage capacity, or a workstation for your database administrator to sit in front of. You have personnel costs. You have internal personnel costs, program staff, subject matter experts, testers, trainers. You have system administrator staff that might not be on the program side, but network administrators, help desk we talked about, programmers. You might have contracts, legal staff, policy staff. So there's a series of personnel costs within the jurisdiction that you need to be thoughtful and, and consider as you're looking at your total cost. Last few categories. Network and communication we talked a lot about already. The hosting side, um, what kind of network do you have? Do you have Wi-Fi? Do you have wires? Um, what environment are you using? What network software do you need to maintain your environments or to maintain your networks to be operational? And then facilities we've already discussed to a large degree as well. Facilities and other costs include project office space, computer room upgrades, security upgrades, and network software and hardware support. So those are some of the examples of costs that you might see in your TCO. And the next slide is a multiple choice question. So which of these costs below is not a hardware or software cost? A pause while the audience responds. Multiple choices are 1. Licenses 2. Servers 3. Laptops and tablets 4. Project office rent and 5. Warranty slash maintenance contract Yep. OK, everybody, you got it right. The project office rent, that would be on a facilities type cost, but not a hardware or a software cost. 98% of participants say project office rent, and 2% say warranty slash maintenance contract. OK. So now we're going to introduce some of the items that we're going to have and some additional um, considerations for states. And then we're going to dive into the actual workbook itself. So if you're the user and the keeper of a TCO, you can decide what your year is. So we talked about it can go three, five, ten years, X number of years. Whether your year starts at the calendar year, the fiscal year, the federal fiscal year, you can decide what that, what what, the, what a year looks like and what your duration is. If you're if you're trying to quantify the cost of internal personnel, you can use an, an assumption or an estimate of 2,080 hours per FTE, and then half time would be 1,040 hours. You can decide how you want to capture costs. Um, the last couple of points are important. Jurisdictions should have an estimate of the number of end users of the system. So some of that planning work that we talked about earlier, so it might just not just be requirements and what do we want the system to do, but truly, how many people would use this system? So the number of users that you have might drive how many people need to be trained, or how many different pieces of, how many different PCs, laptops, or tablets need to be purchased. 
or if you're buying software that has a seat license, so every user must have a license, how many licenses do you need to acquire? Now, it's not as if you have to buy all of your laptops the first year, and it's not as if you can't buy additional licenses if your agency expands, or if your number of end users grows because you extend the functionality to another a sister agency. But starting out with an understanding of how many users do I have, what do I need to sort of have for them to work off of, what's the actual equipment they'll use, how many people do I need to train, those are important to have early on when you're looking at completing your TCO. Right up front we talked about this sort of as early on phases, but you may wish to or need to modify or re-engineer business processes before you're doing your information technology implementation, ideally. So if there's a business process that you want to re-engineer and you want to involve multiple stakeholders in remapping your business processes, ideally you should try to do that before the technology changes because perhaps you want to build workflows into your solution that supports that business process. So we would recommend that, that the idea of which processes we want to revisit and re-engineer, that work should probably be done earlier on, um, either before you start the TPO or very early in the requirements and, and design gathering phase of the process. Some other overarching things for jurisdictions to consider, federal guidance, um, funding, and development approach. So federal guidance encourages system development that promotes data sharing and interoperability, including components and features and modules that can be reused by the jurisdiction. So thinking about child welfare information systems, what are some of the features that, we, that a jurisdiction can use that would support data sharing, interoperability, and modularity? You see that a lot in some of the federal guidance that's coming out. It's been that way in the you know, Medicaid information technology for years. So that's a consideration. Um, funding. So the funding that you need, whether it be state funding or federal funding, that needs to be secured before you undertake the IT, the system acquisition or development effort. I think that seems obvious. But it's not included in the TCO itself, like the cost of writing an APD. I, didn't, I don't have necessarily in the, the version you're going to see, you won't see an a, a placeholder for that, but certainly that's a planning cost that a, a jurisdiction could look at. And then the development approach, that waterfall versus agile. Depending on which approach you take, the level of staff resources, of internal staff resources that you need that are dedicated to the system will really ebb and flow based on the development approach that you have. So if it's waterfall with a huge amount of effort during requirements analysis and design, then you might have a lot of subject matter experts and program staff really front-loaded on the project, and then they can peel off and go back to their, their day jobs. If you do the agile approach, you may need to have a smaller team, but a team that can cycle through multiple iterations over the course of the project life. So those considerations around what does your staffing model look like, what resources does the approach actually, you know, which resources are impacted depending on the approach that we need. I just wanted to point out that those are, those are not the only considerations, but they're important ones. So the next thing I'm going to do is do a quick orientation to what you're going to see in the toolkit, then we're going to do a short demo of some of the costs that we captured in a pretend information system acquisition. Um, a few notes before we go. The example, example presented is a five-year TCO. As we've said multiple times, yours could be shorter or longer. Um, completing a TCO tool is not a requirement for SACWIS or CWIS. SACWIS is the statewide automated child welfare information system. CWIS is comprehensive child welfare information system. And the jurisdictions can customize this TCO to fit their needs. As Kate mentioned earlier, it's available. Um, it's, it's shared up on the Capacity Building Center website. You can add rows, you can add years, you can you know, not use as many categories as you see. So fully customizable, but this is just an example. We're, before we jump into it, I just wanted to orient you to some of the sections that we have. So sections 0 through 7 with you know, ground zero being agency readiness, and you'll see when we launch it that there are some specific costs around agency readiness, which could be time and effort that the agency undertakes to do uh, business process mapping, to do requirements gathering internally, to think about what supports they need to have to supported by the information system. So agency readiness is really ground zero. Then there's personnel and project management costs for actual personnel and staff that will support the project while it's going on, software and hardware, training costs, maintenance costs, and then sort of 
down from four through seven are post-implementation kinds of support costs. So federal rules change, state rules change, business rules change. Um, those changes may need to now be impacted to support the, the end user experience to support the business process. The system may be expanded. It might, it might take on additional agencies. It might take on additional programs. It might be enhanced. And then there's just contingencies. So what kinds of costs might you, you know, you can't know exactly what policy change and policy guidance might come down the road, but maybe we want to plan for some post-implementation contingencies. I also want to point out that some states then have laws and require that um, independent verification and validation vendors or project management often vendors need to be used for a large system implementation. There, there, those costs could be um, in the design, development, implementation phases, but those personnel costs for IV and V vendors or project management vendors, those may or may not be maintained during the maintenance and operations phases. So some of those costs for external vendors to do IV and V and project management might be in phases you know, one through four, but you might not need your project management vendor with you when the system is operational and you're just in a maintenance or change implementation phase. The worksheet, we're going to launch that next, but it will capture costs that are driven by FTEs, so costs that are driven by headcounts, as well as costs that are driven by units or fees. And at this point, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully, and we're going to plug in a few costs. The screen shows a sample total cost of ownership worksheet. The speaker enters data into the worksheet as part of the demo. So hopefully you're looking at an Excel file. There we go. At the very top, um, there are a few notes that we're not going to, you can all read, but it just says if you need to have um, different hourly rates for different staff, add rows, add columns, add your assumptions, and then if you're making tweaks to this, um, make sure you update your formulas from column M over to column Q to make sure you're capturing all the costs that are input on the left side of the screen. So we're going to go through sections like 0, 1, and 2, and then we'll sort of scroll down through the rest of the sections, but we're, we have a few costs that I've done some estimating for. So if you're looking at specifically readiness kinds of costs, so business process mapping perhaps, or cost allocation documentation, or creating new forms, maybe you have one person dedicated to this, maybe they work a third of their time on policy creation, or the forms person might work three quarters of their time. The hourly cost of this person can range from, you know, whatever it is, $100 an hour, $50 an hour. How many hours they work drives is based on what their percent FTE is, and then what is their cost. And as you'll see as I scroll, a lot of those costs will be in that first year, although policy and practice process documentation, maybe that blows over into year two. Maybe practice change, or maybe you see practice change and process documentation changing in year three or year four. But ideally, a lot of that readiness work um, is done right up front. There's a section to capture agency readiness. Then you move into direct services costs. I'll try to do that quickly so it's not so dizzying for you. Um, direct costs for actually developing the system itself. Contract manager, an internal contract manager, an internal project manager, again, part-time, full-time, one person, business analyst, two people, three people, technical analyst, um, subject matter expert. You'll see down here I had an IVNV vendor. The IVNV vendor is going to charge $700,000 a year for this effort, but they're going to only be on board for four years. So you'll see those costs. So the cost of your personnel staff, your, this line is your subject matter expert staff. We had two of them. They're very intense in years one and two. They're less intensely involved in years three and four. Then we're going to go down to the software kinds of costs for the case management software. Licensing fees, we'll see there's 120 units. That's just an estimate of the number of end users that might use the system. Um, there's a testing cost, so you can actually buy testing software. So I looked at a cost for specific vendors testing software package, it was $14,000. There's a cost for configuration that the vendor might do, so that's actually tweaking their own new implementation code or potentially developing 
um, configuration to external interfaces or for external um, consumption. So there's a fixed cost for configuration. The vendor will develop 20 interfaces at $90,000 a piece. And the vendor might charge a flat rate of $500,000 for data migration. And data migration happens in years three, four, and five when the system is up and running. And maybe you migrate everything at once in year three. Maybe you migrate everything at once in year four. Or maybe you did data migration over the course of several years. But as you'll see, the goal of looking at the sheet is some costs you'll experience across multiple years, and some costs will sort of ebb and flow based on the system development lifecycle phase that your project is in. The next section around hardware and software, we're going to actually plug in a few different costs. Specifically, we're going to look at the cost of servers. So this assumes that you're doing the on-premises and you are building out your own internal uh, server room. And you're going to buy four servers that cost $3,800 a piece. And you need those pretty early in the process because you actually need the servers to be up and running because that's helping to support your environment. And then we're going to purchase some software for virtual machines and database licenses. We're going to purchase five of those. And we're going to purchase those up front as well. Then we're going to replace 90 workstations. So up above, we, experience, we estimated 120 end users. But not everybody needs a brand new laptop. And not everybody gets a brand new laptop in the first year. So those costs are spread over later years. Network charges. So this is a cost that your internal uh, agency charges you a certain amount of, you know, three dollars an, an hour for every terabyte of information that you have. So I worked out that this particular hosting will be $140,000 in total, but spread over $20,000 a year. And then office rent. So this is for an external vendor, but you might have your staff co-located with your vendor. About a $3,000 a month lease comes up to about $70,000 times for the year, two and a half offices. So you might build out office space in two different locations, or you might build out office space that is small and gets larger. But the office space as your staff involvement or vendor involvement sort of ramps up and ramps down, you might be able to have smaller office space or renegotiate your lease and only have to support a staff of 12 as opposed to a staff of 40. So those are the costs I want to show. Number one, how these ones are unit driven, which is slightly different from personnel costs, which might be hourly driven. That you see end user costs around things like license fees, or work, uh, workstations and replacements, you would also see end user costs around end user training. And just show that some of the costs are very much upfront and very much um, you know, sort of front loaded and front heavy, but there's still an ongoing cost to maintain. As we'll scroll quickly down, there's two different sections for training, end user training as well as operational support training. So as the IT infrastructure changes, as the application changes, so you now release new functionality in year four. There's a new um, program instruction from ACF, and we need to tweak a specific thing in our case management tracking solution, and we need to go in and add a data value. Well, now you want to train your application staff on how to install that new feature, and you might need to go back and train some end users on how that new case management factor is a new piece of your information system. We've already talked a bit about maintenance, help desk, network administration, um, setting up new users. And then I'm not going to talk anymore about these, but these sections 5, 6, and 7 are all of those changes, expansions, and enhancements. So at this point, I'm going to go back to the slide. I think we have one more polling question. I know you're excited. And then we're going to wrap it up with some final thoughts. Polling question. So this last one is, Please give an example of a cost that is driven by the number of end users. Some examples of costs driven by the number of end users are hardware, workstations, the number of PCs, and web hosting. These are all good. Um, office space may or may not be so much depending on the number of office space might be impacted by the number of personnel that support it. But as it relates to licenses for all of the applications that are running in your office or uh, potentially 
the space that you need to have if you're you know, installing it, building out your program, extending it to different users. Potentially, um, you need to think about office space of a certain size to support your specific uh, staffing model. IVNV may or may not be. It's, it's normally not an end user driven. It's, it's more of a fixed cost from a vendor based on the, the complexity of the project, the duration of the project, and what the requirements are for the IVNV vendor. Everything else, though, licenses, laptops, help desk support, yep, I think that would be, it may not be a one-to-one -one relationship. Every user needs a help desk person, but if you have 500 users, you, certain, you should have a help desk of a certain size to support. 500 people could call at any given time. These are great answers. Um, end user training, cloud computing could be based on the size and the number of people that are hitting it. So those are good answers. Thank you. And at this point, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Kate, and we're going to give you some additional uh, where to find more information kinds of things. Great. Thanks, Michelle. So today um, you saw a lot of really good information about um, total cost of ownership, system development, and it was a high-level overview and um, got into some of the details of, of the spreadsheet and what that looks like. Um, you know, of course, recognizing every jurisdiction is in a unique place relating to system, related to system development. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you know where to go with further questions um, and information. And of course, if you have any questions, for any questions at the moment, we would we would love it if you type it into the Q&A pane, and we'll try to um, try to get those those answers while everyone's on the line. But um, so, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the materials that um, you saw today, the um, the workbook, and then also an um, a, an overview guide. Um, are available on the, under the resources link uh, directly on the Center for State's uh, web page. And so uh, we'd encourage you to go and take a look at those, um, look at the workbook, and, um, and um, you know, think about how you might be able to use it, um, modify it to your needs. We specifically posted it as an Excel document so that you can customize it, um, but still have access to the, uh, the formulas that are already programmed in there. So um, when you, if you have any questions related to, of course, federal guidance, um, we've posted the, the link to, your, to the state and tribal assignments for the Children's Bureau Systems um, State Systems Analysts. Um, and then also, if you're interested in learning more about um, support from the Center for States, you can contact your center liaison. And that link is also one of the resources, find your Center for States liaison. Um, you can contact your regional office specialist, or you can contact me. And um, we will make sure that you get in touch with, um, with the right person or get the information that you are looking for. OK, so we have a few questions coming in. So we'll go ahead and, um, and um, try to address those. Uh, the Agile methodology talks about the cone of uncertainty and the further out you plan, the more inaccurate you will be. Michelle responds. Um, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the cone of uncertainty, although I guess I can understand what it is. Uh, I, I suppose that means that Agile would suggest that a waterfall method, which gets you multiple years from seeing real life product, um, will likely potentially yield something that's not reflective of the current process. So I think that's likely true, well, I've never heard the term, um, but Agile, you're developing features and turning on features and functionality as you go, and therefore you don't have to get, so in contrast to Waterfall where you're planning in 2017 what you think your system might need to do in 2020, 2021. So there's the difference of what you plan for in 2017 is perhaps not where you land three or four years from now when practice changes. So that might be, um, a, you know, a, sort of a, a nod for Agile. There's uh, benefits in, to either one. Go ahead, Kate. I'm sorry, Michelle. There was a, there was a second part to that question that I <laughs> didn't get to. Um, uh, should we expect the vendors to provide this um, if fixed price bid? Provide the methodology? I'm not sure. Another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, actually, the second part of the question was, uh, what is the margin of error that you predict with this model? I don't, I don't think we actually estimated one. 
So uh, the, there is though a contingency that there's contingency built into the development side, and there's also contingency built into the post implementation section seven and section I think it's in section four. So to the extent that you don't know you don't know everything you're going to have to do, and you don't know everything that um, every rule change that might come on, come along in the course of development or maintenance, there is a place for contingency that a lot of projects might maintain 5% or 10% contingency, but you can actually build that into the model for uncertainty. So it could be that it, could be that it wasn't an error, but it could be um, that you just had unexpected things come up and you had a budget line out of plan for that. Okay, great, thank you. And actually the one that I um, mentioned before was the standalone question, should we expect the vendors to provide this if fixed price, if fixed price bid? Provide a total Probably. cost of ownership? Yeah, or, I think that's what it, what it means, provide a total cost of ownership analysis. I suppose you could. Um, I think it would be reasonable for a vendor to help any buyer understand what they might expect as maintenance costs. So to the extent that, yes, a, a, in a bid, in a fixed price bid, you should know implementation for sort of system development. So what are the development costs? What are the interface costs? What are the configuration, the customization costs? And on an ongoing basis, what are the maintenance needs that you would anticipate? Whether you keep the vendor around to do maintenance or you take it in-house, you should have an estimate of how hard is it to build off a new data value or create a new report or add a field to a certain screen. So to the extent that they may not know how long you plan to keep the system, but those maintenance costs in the, in the out years, years you know, four through 20, um, I think it would be important for a vendor to articulate you know, how, how many resources are needed to make a system change, how easy it is to add fields, reports, or values, and that could drive what you think your cost would be for the ongoing maintenance phase. But I think it would be hard to know for anyone um, what changes might be, you know, in the out years related to policy, hence the contingency might be important. Um, then I think I see one, do agencies underestimate report development needs or how to get actionable data out of the system once it's up and running? Would you recommend including cost estimates for that? So there's two, yes, um, there's two different places for report development needs. So there's report writing as a planning function up front. Um, so how many reports do you as a jurisdiction know that you need for CFSR, for uh, legislative folks within your own jurisdiction, for APCARs, et cetera? So you know your reports. You know the reports you've been creating. You know the reports that you struggle to provide every month or every quarter. So absolutely, I think agencies underestimate, um, A, you know, what reports they might need. So again, contingency might be helpful, but also, Getting the information out of the system could be a requirement of your vendor from, you know, you have to build X number of interfaces, you have to build X number of reports, you have to leave us or do knowledge transfer for how to build custom reports. So I think to any extent that you can estimate fixed amounts of reports, expected amounts of reports, which might be contingency, and then maybe a vendor has to help you understand or give you a toolkit of how do I build my own reports that are ad hoc or, you know, just once a year I have to do something. Give me some knowledge transfer, give me a user guide or some other type of assistance so that you can provide, you know, produce that report yourself. That would be my advice. Kate, I'd love for you to weigh in on that one too. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, um, you know, to make sure to consider um, subject matter expertise and, and communication feedback with the, with the field um, as well when you're thinking about things that are going to come up, um, whether through um, some guidance that comes in or, or a change in the practice model or um, implementation of a new um, uh, practice or initiative. I don't see any other questions coming in at the moment. Okay, great. Well, um, yep, no more questions. Oh, sorry, one moment. Looks like one just came in. Um, CWIS requires a data quality practice. How do you recommend costing that process?
Okay. Um, and we heard from Teresa Young, who said that, that that's a good question for the um, Seed with Mailbox. Um, so we'd encourage you to, to submit that question um, to the to the CWIS, um, um email. Please send CWIS questions to ccwis.questions at acf.hhs.gov. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll um, try to provide that before the end of the webinar and, and post it so that you can have access to that and ask that question. Um, and I believe, as far as I can see, that's, that's the last question that's come in. OK, great. OK, and we're in the process of getting that email address posted in case you don't have quick access to it. Um, so I think we can move on in the slide. OK, so just to kind of wrap things up, um, we would really appreciate your feedback um, about this webinar. The survey was a feature for the day of the webinar, and it is now closed. And um, also, um, any other information that would um, help the center improve future programs, webinars, products, and that sort of thing. So we'd really like to hear from you um, about any of those things, that any ideas that you might have or um, suggestions. We, we definitely use that, take that information very, uh, consider it very important and use it, um, use it to, uh, to plan our, our future events. You're also going to receive an email um, within 24 hours with a link to provide that, that feedback. Okay, and I see that the email address has been posted in the Q&A uh, pane if you, um, if you need that. And with that, um, we just want to thank you so much for, for joining us. We provided email addresses for myself and for Michelle if you have specific questions as you start looking at the workbook um, or have any other thoughts or ideas um, uh, about, um, about those products or, or other um, areas of support or if you're interested in uh, learning more about the other services available from the Center for States, um, including tailored services. Contact information for Kate is kate dot m-c-e-l-r-o-y hyphen h-j-e-l-m at i-c-f-i dot com. Contact information for Michelle is m-i-c-h-e-l-l-e dot p-r-i-o-r at verizon dot net. So our email addresses are up there. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, um, and, and uh, we look forward to seeing you here on future events. The Center for States website is https colon slash slash capacity.childwelfare.gov. You can email the Center for States at capacityinfo at icfi.com, or you can contact them by phone at 844 222 0272.